great. Well, welcome everybody to our sixth uh, webinar in this series of Data to Action, Increasing the Use and Value of Earth Science Data and Information. This is, as I mentioned, the sixth in our series, and the series will continue over the next, the rest of this year um, with a few more webinars to, um, to be confirmed. So today we're really excited to have Kim Valentine and Jeb Stewart from NOAA talking about some of the work that's gone on with NOAA um, recently at their environmental data management workshop. And then specifically, one of the people that I ran into at the environmental data management workshop was Jeb Stewart, who's gonna talk about some of the work that's been going on in his group. So first, just a word about ESIP. ESIP is the Earth Science Information Partners. And, um, sorry, we're getting all of my notes. Um, ESIP's vision is to be a leader in promoting the collection, stewardship, and reuse of earth science data and information um, by connecting people across the data life cycle. And that's really what this graphic is meant to show, that we connect people across the data life cycle, across domains, um, and ESIP really has become a brain trust of helping people solve common data and um, technology challenges. We're funded by NASA, NOAA, and USGS, and we currently have more than 120 partnering organizations. And this together has really helped ESIP to become a community of data professional leaders who are um, promoting the collection, stewardship, and reuse of earth science data. And today we're hearing from NOAA, which has been a champion um, of doing this kind of work. So first I'd like to introduce Kim Valentine, who's the acting NOAA Deputy Geospatial Information Officer and one of, one of the co-chairs who planned the recent NOAA Environmental Data Management Workshop. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Kim, and let you share your screen. Okay, great. Okay, you should be able to share. All right, let me know. If you're seeing see it. it. Yep. Okay, great. Seeing it. <clears throat> great. Thank you so much. Appreciate the invite, Erin. Um, like Erin said, um, I am Kim Valentine. I, I've been at NOAA for about 15 years. Um, most recently, um, I guess in the last year and a half or two, I've been acting as our deputy GIO um, among one hat one of the hats I wear. Um, the other hat is, is focused really on data management uh, within the Ocean Service and, and across NOAA. And this year I had the pleasure of serving as the, the chair for the um, 2019 annual um, environmental data management workshop uh, uh, in charge of the, the planning team. So we had, we had a, a large team and I would never take all the credit. Um, and I'll, I'll mention a few of the others in a few minutes, but um, just a little bit of background. Um, the annual workshop is, is hosted and sponsored by our NOAA Environmental Data Management Committee. Uh, this is a, a committee within NOAA that has, that has been around um, as long as I've been there. Um, and it's, it's tasked with um, overseeing really, you know, data man a, broad, a broad array of data management related policies and procedural directives. Um, and, and coordinating a number of things just related to data. Um, and for the last 10 years, we've actually held an annual workshop that is targeted, it's, it's mostly targeted um, towards our internal NOAA data management community. Um, but in, in previous years, we, we've also invited um, outside partners and, and folks from industry and things of that nature. Um, so the pur purpose of the, the workshop is really to, to build upon, um, like I mentioned, these annual workshops, um, the past work, um, lessons learned, um, projects, and anything else going on within NOAA as it relates to data management. Um, this year for, for our 2019 theme, we, uh, we came up with unleashing NOAA's data as a strategic asset for science service stewardship and innovation. And this really, um, means a, a few things. Um, I know it's a long, a long theme, but um, the unleashing data as a strategic as asset is, has some ties to the new uh, federal data strategy um, that, that was released um, earlier this year. Um, and then the science service and stewardship that, that's just inherent with NOAA's mission and our data, data management mission. Um, and then the innovation piece, uh, we really wanted to capitalize on a lot of the momentum and the emerging technologies 
um, going on within NOAA, um, things such as AI and machine learning. We're finally getting to a point in NOAA. I know it sounds archaic, but we're finally getting to a point where we're able to put some things into the cloud. Um, so the innovation piece kind of speaks to, speaks to some of those efforts. All right. So as I mentioned, um, we had a, a big planning team that put this all together. I will say this year was pretty unique in that um, we had members of the Environmental Data Management Committee um, basically raise their hands uh, to co to lead this planning team this year. In the in the past, it's been led by our former chair of the Data Management Committee, that was Jeff um, De La Bougier. Um, so this year it was kind of grassroots led by by our actual committee members, which was which I thought worked out great. Um, so I'm from the I'm technically from the Ocean Service part of NOAA. Um, Eugene Berger uh, was also a, a co-chair of mine. He's from the um, Oceanic and Atmospheric Research Branch of, of NOAA. And then we also had um, our fisheries and our satellite group. Um, so four four out of our four. Four out of our five main line offices uh, within NOAA, uh, we had members uh, from each of those uh, on the planning team, which is great. And then I can't say enough about the, the key partnership that NOAA has with ESIP and, and their ability, ability to help us pull this off um, every year, right? at least as, as many years as I've been involved in this workshop. Aaron's team um, has, has been engaged. And, and as many of you might even know, we often co um, co-host our, our data management workshop at NOAA with one of the ESIP um, summer meetings or, or winter meetings. And this year, unfortunately, just due to timing, um, we weren't able to do that. But we're, we're certainly, Aaron and I have already been talking about hopefully being able to pull that off in the near future um, so that it's, it's even, even stronger of a partnership. So. All right, so just a, a, I provided a quick kind of snapshot of by the numbers just to highlight some of the big picture um, statistics uh, related to kind of our logistics of the workshop. Um, this was actually the 10th anniversary this year, 10th anniversary of us um, holding this within NOAA, and also the first time that it was ever hosted outside the DC area. Um, within our planning team, we we did a lot of we did a lot of analysis on on how we could get away with with hosting it outside the DC area, to be frank. Um, so many, you know, our, our, our NOAA headquarters is in the DC area, but we have so many uh, field offices, Seattle, Boulder, Asheville, um, you know, a number of places throughout the country. And, um, and so it always ends up getting hosted in DC just because it's, it's always uh, more cost, cost efficient or economically. Um, but it, it, it just has always done that. Um, this time we, we definitely branched out and, and I'll, Tell you where we where we were located in a minute, but in general, um, in the past, I think we've maxed out. I think registration is always maxed out um, at 200 as our limit. I don't know if we've ever had 200 um, um, actually attend in person, but this year we um, we did host it in Seattle, Washington, and um, we had close to 170 people total um, attend in person, which is which is phenomenal. We had um, uh, we also had 80 folks, 80 unique users dial in remotely to one or more of the plenary sessions or, or one or more of the breakout sessions throughout the, the two-day workshop. Um, so as far as, as attendees and, and participation, it was, it was incredible. Um, we had, uh, like I mentioned, two days, um, a, a number, the number of sessions we ended up having, we had three concurrent uh, uh, breakout sessions going on, so a total of 14 different topics. Um, and three separate panel discussions, um, a total of 70 presenters that were presenting throughout the plenaries and the breakout sessions, and then we had a, a, a small poster session um, with about 20 posters. The one on the right is just an example of one of one of the posters from our geospatial group that we that we highlighted there. Um, okay, so just a, a sorry sorry the text is kind of small, but a, just a snapshot of the two days. The green boxes that you'll see. Our, our plenary session. So we had um, time devoted each morning um, on day one and day two to a, a morning plenary session. And then we had a closing plenary session at the end of day two. And then the yellow boxes um, indicate our breakout sessions um, where you'll see we had three concurrent sessions going on at a time. Um, and then the end of day one is when we had our, our actual poster session. 
Um, and I will highlight that uh, the, the plenary and kind of the focus for the day one plenary was more um, about um, the policy, data management policy side of the house. Um, and then day two, we tried to use that plenary session to, to focus on a more technical plenary session uh, with a technical keynote speaker um, and a, a cloud and AI panel. So that's just a, a snapshot of, of the two day. Um, as I mentioned, uh, day one was really more focused on policy. So we had, um, we had the, we were, we were incredibly lucky to have uh, Rebecca Williams from the OMB, she's from the White House, and she's actually been, she worked in the previous Obama administration on a lot of the open data policy efforts. Um, she's also been part of, of uh, the current administration's work on the federal data strategy, um, also the Geospatial Data Act, um, the executive order on artificial intelligence, and a number of other things. Um, so she was there and kind of kicked us off from the policy side for day one, and then day two, as I mentioned, we were trying to hone more in on the technology side, so we invited a, an outside um, gentleman by the name of Paco Nathan from, um, from industry, um, over 35 years in, in the, the uh, realm of data science and machine learning, um, and he was, he was just absolutely fabulous as our, as our industry speaker. Um, just a quick snapshot of, of the type of sessions that we had. Um, some of the ones you'll notice on this list um, uh, remind me of, of some of the earlier days and, and, and threads, uh, session topics that are, that are a common thread throughout each annual workshop, things like metadata and data archiving, um, things of that nature. Um, you'll see some of those that are still there. We also had um, a geospatial track, and then we also, you'll see in here we have some some other more creative, you know, creative data solutions, cloud service technologies, um, R&D, research and development, um, and, and some other things about data integration. Um, so I thought we had a nice um, breadth of topics and, and things for, for our actual sessions. Um, and then the panels at the bottom, we had uh, in, inside NOAA, we have several um, line offices that have data management working groups. So we got those groups together to talk and basically share information about what each one is doing um, within their line. And, and I think that session went, went really well just to share across and within our organization. And then we had a special, um, a little bit more of a technical hands-on um, metadata tool training. And uh, one of the big things that's happened within NOAA in the last couple of years is our National Centers for Environmental Information. Um, it's basically the old NOAA data centers. Um, so we had we had three or four major data centers um, that have now combined into one national center of environmental information and and they're responsible for for all of our archive requirements um, so because there's been a lot of a lot of change um, organizationally going on and and reorganization uh, within the national centers for environmental information um, the that, that was a hot topic and so they really wanted to have a, a dedicated panel to talk about progress and, and hear from the audience on how they're, how they're doing well and, and where they can improve. So also very positive. Um, the closing plenary uh, this year, we, we actually ended up choosing to spin it a little differently. Um, in the past, I think they, uh, we have chosen to, to debrief on each of the sessions because they're concurrent. Not everyone can attend each session, so um, we use it as kind of a, a summary, you know, one slide or two minutes for each session to, to provide everybody kind of with the key next steps. This year, uh, we decided to feature kind of a local um, state of Washington climatologist and a couple other featured speakers um, and, and didn't necessarily um, do work a lot in the closing plenary on kind of a summary recap and what was next. Uh, what we decided to do instead uh, was to have our session chairs, you know, summarize their session slides. We're going to share those and, and post those on the website. I've included our our sked our sked site that's that's linked here um, that has the entire schedule um, with all of the presentations for each session, and we intend to provide um, that summary for each session, um, hopefully within the next week. Um, because we had because this year was different and we were in a different you know geography geographic location. Um, we did have such a great turnout, and we had some unique sessions and remote attendees. 
um, we really worked, the planning team worked to um, to develop a, an evaluation survey or post-workshop uh, survey to get some results and some, some feedback from, from everyone. So I'm, I'm hoping that um, the feedback from that is going to really help um, provide us with insight on how it went, but also help us tailor uh, where we should be and where we should be looking for next year. Um, as far as other next steps, we're, we're going to be just debriefing our executive sponsors internally um, and as well as doing something like this to, to um, share the information with ESIP. Um, and then we are now already starting to think about the next year's uh, workshop and um, a, different, a different group will be chairing it. The, the co-chair this year, OAR, um, is going to chair next year's planning team. Um, so they're, they're going to start spinning up because it, just to be honest, I've, I've definitely been part of this, this, this workshop for many years and, and on the planning team, but never led the planning team. And um, it, it, it is certainly a lot, of, a lot of effort, as I'm sure many of you guys know from your meetings. Um, but, but yeah, I think overall it was incredibly successful and um, happy to take any, any questions if you have them. Um, I, I've included the, the workshop website there, as well as our NOAA Environmental Data Management Committee's website, if, if anyone's interested in, in more about the scope of the actual data management committee um, outside the context of the workshop, and my contact information as well. So thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you, Kim. This was a great summary, and I think that you're really right to emphasize that um, this planning team did a great job, and I think the transition from Jeff to this new kind of planning style worked really well. And it was also, I think, interesting to have it in Seattle. So we do have time for a couple of questions if anybody has specific questions for Kim about the overall, the EDM workshop. Sounding like no questions. Um, a lot of people on the list are people who we're at the workshop, so. Um, yeah, I was looking at the list and a lot of those names are familiar. familiar faces. So um, I think we'll just, we'll go ahead and move on to Jeb's specific talk. Um, and Jeb is from OAR, from Ezreal, um, the Earth System Research Lab. And um, Jeb, I will pass the control to you. Um, Okay, can you hear me okay? We can hear you great. So we'll let you take it away. Thanks, Jeb. No problem. So let me get into present mode here. So I'm Jeb Stewart. I, uh, yeah, since a lot of you are at EDM, this might uh, have some repeat material from that. Um, but I work at the Earth System Research Laboratory here in Boulder, Colorado. I'm part of the what's called the Global Systems Division. Oops, wrong button. Present. Uh, and we focus a lot on atmospheric modeling or coupled modeling and as well as information systems to work with some of the National Weather Service uh, partners or FAA partners. Uh, and so, yeah, thanks for the invite. I'm here today to talk about kind of some of our projects we do uh, dealing with uh, the increasing volumes of numerical uh, data for numerical weather modeling. Um, so one of the areas we talk about often here for our group is called the exascale, exascale era. So we have enormous data challenges that come with exascale. In terms of observations, we have a variety of new satellites that are launched, uh, polar orbiting or geospatial. Uh, we have a variety of new observation uh, platforms or systems like unmanned aerial systems, as well as when we start to talk about all the different sensors out there, we have internet of things. So there's a lot of different equipment out there that's making observations for us. So can we take that information? Can we process it? Can we make sense of it? Can we use it for our processes here? Uh, so gathering that data, making it effective for uh, creating a state of the atmosphere, then we run our atmospheric models on this, our environmental, or I guess our system models on this, it could be a coupled with ocean as well. And we talk about those models, we're starting to get into an era where we get high resolution global cloud resolving models. This means uh, three kilometer grid point spacing. Uh, so each grid, uh, each, uh, and this, uh, when we start talking about this, we also start to generate ensembles of data. So we get tremendous amounts of volumes of data that we then need to post process uh, create visualization analytics from that and then deliver it to our forecasters and stakeholders. And so when we talk about our kind of pipeline here, we kind of look at this as an exascale future. This is several years down the road, but it is uh, there's enormous data challenges, data wrangling challenges here. We see 
Uh, and we have a hard time handling the data we produce today. Uh, so uh, what are tools we can do to take advantage of that and leverage the, uh, the data we have today as well as prepare for the future? Um, so one of those tasks and the one I'm going to spend most of my time about talking today is related to machine learning. Um, the way I like to talk about machine learning is that it's kind of a different way of programming in a sense. So previously we had our classical programming scheme where you had rules and we had data. Uh, based on those rules, we could derive answers. So we had kind of an understanding of how we got from A to B, uh, from data to answers. When we talk about machine learning, uh, we have data and we have answers, but we may not necessarily understand the rules of how we got there. Uh, in some cases, we already understand the rules, but machine learning is a way that we can do this even faster than traditional programming techniques. So once we understand the relationship, uh, once we've trained a particular model, the training process can be slow. The other stage of this so inference, once the model's been trained, when it makes the predictions or makes the answers, are, uh, it is very fast. And so it can find those relationships uh, between theirs, uh, between the, our data and our uh, answers and drive that, those answers relatively quick. Uh, I have a couple other graphics. This slide is kind of busy, but I just wanted to kind of highlight that, you know, machine learning, while it's talked about a lot, there's a lot of black box and mis uh, information about there, uh, what it does, but it really can do a multilinear regression, nonlinear regression towards uh, answers. So a simple network is just one node where you get from X is your data, Y being your answer, uh, and you have one node, you can do linear regression. So the first graph here shows that if you have uh, one node and then you have 10 nodes or 100 nodes, if it's just a linear relationship, it can find the answer relatively quickly. When it starts to get more complex and you have multiple, uh, you have a nonlinear equation, you use a network that has a, a couple different nodes uh, between your X and your Y, your data and your answers, uh, you can start to fit these curves uh, relatively well. So the red line here is just if you use the single node. So you see it's trying to fit a linear reg uh, regression to this curve, which isn't correct. But as you added more nodes uh, from 10 to 100, that's these items between X and Y here, uh, you can see that you can fit that curve pretty well. And so we talked about getting from data to answers. There's multiple ways we can construct these networks. We can do multiple layers. We can do a lot of cool things. We can cover these nonlinear relationships. We can even color non-contiguous. So if there was a break in this line, we can cover these uh, answers pretty well. And so if we're able to get these uh, from these data to the answers relatively fast, we can use this in our atmospheric modeling. And why is this important for us? There's a couple different reasons here. Uh, as I mentioned before, we're receiving way more data than we can ever process. Uh, and when we select the data, uh, we use it only a subset, roughly 7% is selected and roughly 3% is ultimately used in numerical weather prediction. So huge variance of data received versus data that's actually used in atmospheric modeling. This is for a variety of reasons. One is performance. Uh, we only have a set number of time, limit of time when we're doing atmospheric models where we can process information. Typically we have 10 to 20 minutes to process all observations for that hour before we can go on to the next stage. And so we just run out of time. Uh, another aspect of this is that some of the data points represent their neighbors really well. Uh, but this may not be the case of rapidly changing areas, but for the most case, those points that we receive represent their neighbors well, so we can trim the data down before we process it. So we're looking at machine learning because uh, we want to try to process, get more information on this data, try to extract more value from this data. Also from a power concern, if we keep at our current path to try to process all this data, uh, our affordable power limit, we're going to quickly run into that, especially when we go into ensembles, running a multiple model with different conditions. And so we're looking at ways to be more kind of wiser, I guess, about how we do this. We also have a variety of initiatives from the higher level NOAA that says that you should look into AI. Uh, so a variety on this uh, slide here, and I can share with you if you're interested. Take a look at more detail on each of these. But so we're getting pushed from power constraints, we're pushed from our uh, partners, as well as pushed from uh, higher level uh, policies that we need to put in place. Uh, there is a variety of places that uh, we see that uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning can apply to uh, our, our uh, environment here. Uh, we have concepts of detection, so just being able to see, uh, emulate what human eyes are able to pick up. So we can look for cyclones, whether it be tropical or extratropical. We can look for convection initiation. We can look for different features, clouds, convection initiation, extreme weather. We can look at this in terms of translating from one space to another. When you have satellite observations, they're in radiances typically, so can you revert those radiances to weather parameters like pressure, wind, temperature? Uh, the machine learning AI can fit in there. Uh, and there's a lot of areas with forecast verification, comparing models, and just creating images. Uh, predictions in other areas, so looking at storm tracks or getting uncertainty uh, or, um, or storm intensity. Now, with uh, machine learning, while it's pretty good, 
uh, it has troubles with extrapolation. So if you have a representative data set that's kind of all encompassing, uh, it performs pretty well. But if you feed up through a set of observations that it's never seen before, or not even close to what it's seen before, it will almost pick a random answer for you. So when you're going through that training process, you really want to have all encompassing data sets with seeing all particular permutations of this data set. There are ways to help guide this, to restrict it and restrain it. Uh, but for the most part, uh, you get a lot of uncertainty if you get into areas where it hasn't seen data before. So prediction is kind of one of those areas where it's maybe stretched for some conditions, but for other areas it might work pretty well. Depends on your data set you're training against. We talk about enhancement. This is about anomaly detection, uh, super resolution, creating new imagery, filling in bands. You often see where data is missing in particular features here. And for the GO-17 satellite, they are using an NVIDIA image inpainting algorithm, which will help fill in these gaps where it misses data. And it's performing relatively well. Uh, there's some questions about the scientific accuracy of it, and they're currently evaluating that to take a look and see if they can improve that type of information. And for us, in the modeling perspectives here, there's ways we can accelerate physics as well as look into microphysics and parameterization. So there's a variety of different areas where we can apply this. So where does this kind of break down versus traditional machine learning approaches? We see it with self-driving cars, we see it with uh, uh, videos, we see it with a different, couple of different areas. But for us, we have some unique uh, challenges to Earth science. Uh, we have a great spatial temporal structure, so our data is kind of related both in time and space. Uh, we have multi-source, multi-resolution data. We have a variety of different uh, aspects there, so we, we, a variety of different data sets we can bring together for this. Uh, one that's kind of interesting is that when we look at our pictures, when you look at uh, traditional mean le machine learning algorithms and saying, that, hey, there's a cat in this picture, there's a dog in this picture, it's pretty clear you can outline where that dog or cat is. When we talk about atmospheric features in particular, like uh, cyclones, uh, an extratropical cyclone, a low oak system, uh, we as meteorologists don't often agree on where the center or where that uh, storm ends or begins or when it's formed. And so if we disagree, it's kind of hard to teach the machine the right answer. So we have to, we can do heuristics and get relatively close answers, uh, but there might be uh, objects with fuzzy boundaries. It's not an exactly a clean cut of where the objects are in our imagery. While we have tremendous data, uh, we also have a lack of labeled data. So this is where if you want to say where a uh, cat is in an image, you, there's a lot of data sets out there that say, there's, here's 100 images and here's where the cat are in those 100 images. But we have to develop those in our uh, atmospheric realm. We don't have a lot of labeled data that helps with the supervised machine learning process. Uh, another aspect here is that the, we want to understand how this algorithm works. So there's, in traditional machine learning techniques, uh, you have random forests to support vector machines. You have a lot of information about how that, uh, how you got to that answer. Uh, with random forests, it's a, basically a collection of decision trees. And so if X is greater than some value, it goes down the branches of the decision tree. A random forest then takes a bunch of those different uh, trees together and it can create probabilistic output from a random forest, but at least you have a sense of how those answers were derived. Uh, when you start talking about neural networks, you have thousands to millions of different parameters. It's very difficult to understand how and why uh, your algorithm got the results of it. So we're trying to better understand that and to have scientists have the information at their hands to understand that is important for us. And as I mentioned with the GO17 ABI imager here, you can create images that look realistic, but how do you know the scientific accuracy? And so that's kind of other things we have challenges with that we need to look into. Uh, so now I'm gonna get into a couple different projects we work on here at GSD. One is what we call regions of interest. This is where we're looking for areas of active weather and satellite imagery uh, from tropical cyclones to extra tropical cyclones. Uh, we wanna pull these areas out for the data assimilation process. So in the data assimilation, that's where we create the initial state of the atmosphere for atmospheric modeling. So here's what the atmosphere is right now at this particular minute, and then we can move forward to create a forecast off that. Uh, when we create and symbol, when we bring in all the observations in the data assimilation process, we have areas of uncertainty where the atmosphere is not, uh, we don't have a lot of observations. We, so we, there's areas where we're not quite sure what that state is. And then we can also have areas of actor weather that we can pull from satellite imagery here. And the idea behind this is that we combine the two. So if we only have 10 minutes to process all available observations, concentrate on the areas of overlap where we have active weather as well as the uncertainty from the initial state and process the more observations from those areas and ignore the other areas where we have a better handle, better handle the atmosphere. And so this is work we've been working on to do. Uh, I'm going to show an example here of tropical cyclones. Uh, so we use satellite data. So you see this top image on the right here is an input that's been colorized in the RGB channels. It's a water vapor channel from uh, GOES, uh, the old GOES, GOES imager. 
our label data looks like this. It's boxes. So basically, uh, to find a bounding box around where the cyclones, tropical cyclones, are in this particular image. So it's a yes, no binary answer. Um, this just kind of combines the two. But these two, this is what we put in is our data. This is what we put in as our answer. And we're trying to figure out if the machine uh, through these algorithms can do, uh, find the relationship between the two to see these features in water vapor imagery for the satellite. Uh, for this, this is a lot of information here, but we're using this UNET uh, neural network structure. Uh, it is able to capture, so you have the original data size that's put in uh, at the top of the CU on the upper left. And it goes through different stages of convolutional networks, uh, which and then pooling, which is a lot of information to say it's compressed and different features are extracted from it. And so these have uh, the unit has this unique skip connect feature that goes from the input to output. But this allows us to see both long wave and short wave features. It's kind of a summary of the slide is that we're by using this structure, we know the atmosphere has long wave and short wave features. So we're trying to capture some of that information in the neural network itself. And so we're able to do that. And this is a, a, a example we found uh, on Kaggle.com as well as a couple of different other sites uh, where um, people are using this successfully for different image segmentation challenges. So where is the cat in this picture? Where is the car in this picture uh, type challenges? And so we thought it'd be a good situation for us. So I'm going to show you a video here. Hopefully it comes across the go-to meeting well. On the top is the manual labels. So this is actually the, the truth. This is where, based on the IV tracks, uh, International Best Track Archive for Climate Stewardship data, uh, where tropical cyclones were. The bottom is when we've, uh, after our network's been trained on this particular data set, uh, where does it, the network think these tropical cyclones are? And so start the video here. You'll see some false positives on the oblique angles of the image, which is okay for our purposes because we can use a different satellite to get more of those closer to the middle of the image. But here you can see, as we get to the middle of this video, where it picks up uh, pretty well the tropical cyclones and even sometimes before they reach that tropical storm category. Uh, and so this is kind of some of the work we're doing with machine learning to pull out features, identify information extracted from these large data streams uh, to use for other processes. Another area that's very similar that we're looking for is convection initiation. So where is convection going to form in the future? Uh, so we, as humans, can see different features in satellite imagery. And so we're looking to see if we could train a neural network here to look and see if we can find those same features and identify convection initiation before it actually occurs uh, using satellite imagery. So this uses a time sequence. Uh, this is uh, if we're trying to do a 30 minute lead time. Um, we have, we take the radar images, we convert that to a binary, where is there deep convection, which is uh, greater than 35 dBZ, which is the value in the radar. And we use satellite from two different channels. Uh, we use uh, three time steps, so T minus 50, T minus 40, T minus 30. Uh, and this is over Taiwan, so this is using HIMOR satellite. And so we, the training process does not use radar except to generate the label. So it doesn't, has no context of where actual radar echoes are as part of the training process. So all it has is the information from the satellite imagery. And so here's another video with the truth on the left and the, uh, the results from our neural network on the right here. And it's able to pick up pretty well areas of convection. You see it's a little more, uh, not as granular as what the truth is, but in general, it picks up the areas pretty well. We're looking for areas of new convection. So this is kind of more areas, it's alerting forecasts as to where convection might be occurring uh, in the future uh, using this. So a couple of different areas we're applying machine learning. Uh, another area is that we uh, is looking at soil moisture for atmospheric mowing. Uh, traditionally, soil moisture is cycled from run to run, which means that there's no actual direct observation of soil moisture. Uh, based on how surface temperature and winds behave, they adjust the soil moisture field in the model. Uh, so we're looking to get more information from uh, here from satellite to better inform the model about the state of that uh, soil or moisture is. In this particular process, we're seeing uh, good results with low errors using random forest techniques, so more of a traditional uh, uh, measure. And so we're still evaluating uh, our accuracy here, but we eventually hope to be using this to see if we improve the model uh, by having a better initial soil moisture state. Another area we're looking at is fire radiative powers. And so right now in our atmospheric models, they use a climatological curve of how the fire behaves. So they use satellite detections, they detect a fire, and then based on that condition, based on climatology, here's how we expect that pixel to behave over time. So we know that during the day, the fire will flare up and at night it will dampen down. And that curve is the exact same for every fire, no matter where it's detected. But we know that's not how fires behave. And so we're looking to see if we can get information about that current uh, atmospheric conditions to better modulate this curve of how the fire is expected to behave. 
saying if it's going to get dry and windy uh, like it is here out in Boulder, Colorado today, uh, those fires could flare up really quick and burn really hot, really fast, emitting a lot of smoke uh, and uh, information. Whereas if you have a cooler night uh, or cooler day and cloudier or damper weather, uh, that fire curve would be dampened down, uh, tampered down. And so adjusting these curves of how the fire is expected to behave over time based on atmospheric conditions. And this is another case where we're using random forest to get data information. Uh, so for us, I mentioned that, uh, what's ahead here? So I mentioned that neural networks are not necessarily the best at prediction, at extrapolation beyond what it's seen before. One way to constrain that is to use this process called physics-guided learning. So this introduces uh, physics into the what's the called the loss function, uh, which allows us to constrain the model. So it doesn't go haywire if it sees new data when it goes into that extrapolation condition. It tries to uh, adhere to at least some physics behind that process. So it gives you an answer closer to the truth. This will help us prevent from blowing up when we get to that uh, data that's never seen before. And so this is like if you have a conservation of mass, a physical law, you can add that term into your loss. And so you know that uh, if, you're, if you're not conserving mass, that that's a bad answer. And it helps the, the model learn for not only using less data, but also helps it conform to physics since so we can get better, better results if we happen to encounter data where we're extrapolating. Other applications we're looking to uh, are, um, so I guess these are kind of out of order, but we're looking into radio transfer, uh, connection and parameterization, other functions here. Uh, anomaly and bias correction uh, from observations. We want to use machine learning for those processes. Chemistry modeling is traditionally expensive. Uh, we want to optimize those processes if we can use the machine learning for the different chemical species so we can improve uh, our forecast, the time of the availability of our forecast. And data fusion, this is taking data from several different sources uh, to get out there. We're also looking at developing tools to for or a better understanding interpreta interpretation of results from using neural networks. So this was looking at what, when we look at those tropical cyclones I showed earlier, if we're, what is the neural network keying in on, on that particular image to say, yes, this is indeed uh, a tropical cyclone. I, our expectations are that once you see the eye, uh, it's going to highlight that really quickly. So you know that it's not some text in the corner or something like that. So there was cases where people were looking at uh, horses. I, I don't remember the exact study here, but uh, the neural network performed pretty well. Uh, but when they did one of these studies on it to look for an understanding, they saw that there was text in the corner that's labeled that as a particular horse. And so that's all the neural network was seeing. They could key on that text and very quickly say that was there was a horse in that image. And so trying to avoid those type of mistakes, trying to see what it's looking for, what's finding in those images. So we have a good understanding of why it's saying what it is. There's also other ways of looking at uncertainty. So getting uncertain information back from these neural networks. So we have an understanding of what's its confidence in these results. That can, then that can be used for other processes as well. So that's kind of an overview of our machine learning efforts. Uh, I didn't want to go too much in depth into all our, all. Of, we have quite a few different projects here, but when we look at Exascale, we have a couple different efforts combined. So we have the machine learning effort, we have a couple different areas that we're looking into. Uh, we're also heavily invested into uh, using the cloud technologies, cloud computing. Uh, this involves looking at moving the processing closest to the data we can. So stop moving the large data sets around, especially when we talk about the ensemble data we're, we're there or the observations that are already going into cloud platforms. Can we process the observations in the cloud and then simplify that data before it's sent to our supercomputers or vice versa? Uh, looking for more tools to allow users to manipulate, work with this data once, they, once it's been processed. Uh, and then the idea of serverless computing, which uh, you, if you're familiar with Lambda functions and Amazon or other ways where you don't physically use a server anymore, you create a process that's called uh, when, it, when, it's, when you need it. And so that you can reduce your cost by uh, only using computing when you need it. If you have a process that uses the computer all the time, and this may not make sense, but for us, when we're generating images or processing data, we don't necessarily fully utilize our systems today. So taking better advantage of the serverless to reduce our costs when we process these data streams. Uh, the other efforts are looking at advanced data processing. So we're getting into a realm that's highly asynchronous and event-driven. Uh, so we have a bunch of different calls that with their event data is processed as it's needed uh, and not waiting for those in the code or moving on to the next task and waiting for the answers to call back when they get there. So this becomes a kind of a software nightmare in some ways because it's hard to debug, it's hard to trace where things might go wrong, uh, but it's a very efficient process if we can get it working correctly to take advantage of these data streams. That's kind of all I had for today. Um, that's one of different aspect. There's a variety of ways we're looking at this, but the goal here is to really try to, with machine learning, is try to extract inf better information or high quality information or emulate the existing processes significantly faster than we have before uh, to handle this, these large data streams as we bring them in. So with that, I can open up to any, if there's any questions.
Cool. Thanks so much, Jeb. Um, this was, I think, a perfect overview and really fits the theme of data to action really well. Are there questions for Jeb? Hi, Jeb. Oh, go ahead. Yep, Anna. This, this, this is Anna downstairs from you. Um, <laughs> are you are you using the ABI the GOES 16 data that are is hosted on the cloud for you? Uh, no, not we, so we have the fortunate access to uh, HPC in our group. Oh, okay. And so we are able to we move we are using GOES. ABI data, um, but because we have this compute resource available to us for no cost, we move the data there and process it there. So if that were to go away for some reason, I definitely would be using this in the cloud. But for now, since we have that free resource available to us, that's where we process data. Okay. Do you use any of the? Okay, thank you. That answered my yep. question. Yep, no problem. And we do, I guess, so for some of the other exascale projects where we generate tiles or generate imagery, uh, we are using uh, data in the cloud. Um, but it's we oftentimes, for performance reasons, need to reformat it. So uh, NetCDF is a necessary cloud-friendly format. Uh, so for our performance optimizations, we'll take that data and reprocess it um, and then use it for generating tiles or other things. So I don't know if there's more, there might be more questions related to that. <laughs> we use uh, X-rays R, uh, for those of you who might be familiar with the techni technology, which is an underlying technology at Pangeo for those familiar with that project, so. Hey, Joe, this is Nancy Ritchie. How are you doing? Good, how are you doing, Nancy? Doing great. Um, since you've had experience working with data in the cloud, I'd like to pick your brain not here, of course, but pick your brain in the future to to learn more about those formats that are cloud friendly, so that sure. we can start working in that direction. Yeah, and it's also worth noting that the NetCDF group is looking into those same technologies to mm -hmm. support those natively as well. So eventually, we're all going to converge, I hopefully, onto these more cloud friendly tech, uh, packages. But I'd happily talk to you if you want to reach out to me separately. Great, thank you. Other questions or comments for Jeb? Hey Jeb, this is Rich Signal. Hey Rich. Hey Jeb, uh, I, I guess um, I, was, I was trying to think of um, some of the machine learning challenges in the in the ocean modeling side, and I guess a lot of the same ones uh, you mentioned are applicable there. Uh, or do you know of any unique uh, ocean uh, machine learning issues that are that would be different than the atmospheric ones. Uh, the only one I can think of is that uh, while it is contiguous, you do run into more boundaries potentially in the ocean because it's the atmosphere. You know, we have a kind of a contiguous across the globe, whereas ocean you run into land eventually. I don't know if that makes a difference for <laughs> some yeah. of us. Uh, that's the only one I can, I can think of off the top of my head. But you know, there's a lot of similar challenges. Yeah, just the what is it? What are these features? Are large data sets and uh, um, different processes involved? The different parameterizations or physics schemes that are involved? Yeah. And is there um, where if I wanted to know if I wanted to learn more about the like your U your U <laughs> the U <You're> not, <laughs> uh, where would I go? Uh, so. It, there are a variety of resources online uh, for this. There's the original paper that it came from, but it can be on the scientific side. So if that's something you like, that's definitely a place to start. Uh, but there's there are a couple different blogs that cover these different aspects, like Towards Data Science, I think, .com. I forget the other one, I, I, uh, but the Towards Data Science has a lot of different articles. And I can send you, I can send you or the group or whoever might be interested articles that kind of discuss what is involved in the UNET structure. OK. Hey, Jeb, it's Nancy again. 
you talked about your learning data sets. What kind of an effort does it take to create those? Uh, or training data sets. Sorry. Yes, yeah, so training data sets. It depends on your labels. I guess the biggest. Um, so labels being what if you're doing image segmentation, your 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 answer you're trying to get to. Uh, if you have an existing algorithm, an existing heuristic uh, to label that, and you know for tropical cyclones we have the IV tracks, which is a very great data set for that. Um, the labeling process to generate those that that training test data set is pretty easy. When we get to data sets where there's a little ambiguity or we don't have good heuristics or algorithms to determine it, uh, those can take quite a while to draw to generate your your set. So we need to work with experts to kind of define or try to find a way to automate that process, but sometimes it is just hand, uh, people going through images and labeling it. And our group, not our group, but other groups I know have used like Mechanical Turk on Amazon to help with some of those piece, uh, pieces, but that can be very time consuming to generate those. Uh, so it depends on really what, what uh, thing you're trying to solve. If you have, so good data yeah, goes a long way with machine learning. So if you already have uh, the kind of the uh, two data sets you're trying to work with, or the data sets you're trying to work with, uh, that, that generating those process, uh, training and test data sets is relatively quick. Do you see in the future working with, say, NCEI to cre help you create those data sets? That would be great. Uh, <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, because I, I know there's a lot of archive uh, for some of these things. I, you know, I mentioned IV tracks, but mm -hmm. if there's other ways or other known ways of labeling extratropical or tro uh, atmospheric rivers or features that people might be interested in, um, yeah, I, I definitely, I, I think it'd be useful for a wider audience than just us. Okay, thanks. Yeah, the collaborative creation of training data and then sharing training data seems, training data set seems like it's a big need. It is, yeah, and getting those to a place where people can use them so that we have our data and then having our training data or labels associated with that. Uh, putting those similar places so that other people can expand upon the science or find other cool relationships, I think is, is worth the endeavor. Jeb, this is sure. Rama, Rama oh, from, uh, Go ahead, Rama. Uh, from NASA. Um, you talked about soil moisture and I didn't see the uh, SMAP, soil moisture active passive data yep. from NASA. I was wondering if you're using it. Uh, we have looked at using it. Uh, we're trying to get a higher resolution data. I believe it's a uh, 15 kilometer uh, for that product and it's only once a day if I'm kind of correctly. Uh, so for the for our atmospheric model that we're trying to put this into, we're trying to look for an hourly product at a higher resolution. So we've looked at it to, to kind of use it as a label for truth, but we're trying to see if we can get better truth for training our network on it. If that makes sense. Thanks. Jeb, you mentioned the blog towards datascience.com. I wonder if there are any other resources. Um, ESIP has a machine learning cluster, and actually Ann Wilson, who runs that, um, is on the call. And you know, that group has been doing, I think, some kind of self-led learning around, um, around the topic. So are there other machine learning resources or other resources that you'd recommend? There is. I, I was trying to remember the other one. I mean, there's a. I will. I can find some and forward them to you. And okay, cool. Uh, we can the share the group. Definitely a good one. Hi, this is Ann. Yeah, I would definitely like to hear that. <clears throat> and also, um, I just finished writing a rough draft for um, that. I want to. I'm running by our cluster about our, a session proposal for winter. Um, to do a presentation and maybe a, a little workshop on labeling tools. Mm -hmm. So I, we we just it's we just hatched that today. So not quite sure yet about it, but we're we're thinking about it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, labeling is interesting tools to help people label, and 
you know, if it's sometimes it takes a grad student or this mechanical Turk to just help to get some information. We've all done those CAPTCHAs for Google, you know, for years. So right. where's the car and where's the license plate? <laughs> That's all part of this generating labels. Hey, Jeb. Hello. Hello. Yes. <clears throat> hey, Jeb. This is this is Dave Jones. Sorry, I was trying to talk on the webinar, but I was watching on my phone, so it wasn't it wasn't being very cooperative. So I had to dial back in. Um, since uh, since Aaron mentioned. Uh, uh, collaborative uh, kind of training materials and stuff. Do you? Uh, I noticed that you said during your um, during your presentation that you create uh, tiles. Uh, are you creating like uh, web map tiles or uh, tiles that we can use within geospatial applications? Specifically, like we have uh, GeoCollaborate to share that stuff out in real time across any platform. Uh, so we. The answer is yes and no. <laughs> so we are generating tiles that could be shared. The problem is, is that uh, our cloud resources that we run these on are on a protected network. We're not on a public network yet. So in the future, yeah. yes, but not right now. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's that's good to know, and it's good to you know once once it's able to, or if those tiles could be copied to a different location for you know public access, but um, you know and sharing. But you know it would be applicable towards specific use cases and stuff like that. So I wasn't thinking like right off the bat, but just sometime in the future. So that's that's great. Okay. Great. So we have time for maybe one or two more questions. If anybody's got any last thoughts. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Deb, for your willingness to share um, the specifics of your work. Um, and it was good to run into you a couple of weeks ago. Yes, very good. Thanks. Thanks for the invite. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah. So just to wrap up, everybody, um, Anne mentioned the winter meeting. So I want to put another um, sort of call out that the winter meeting for ESIP will be January 7th to the 9th back in Bethesda, Maryland. Um, and we're continuing this theme of um, increasing the use and value of Earth observations um, and data to action um, with this data to work theme. And that has both the continued kind of data to action of how we're using data, but also this idea of playing on work um, with the public-private partnership um, building that might happen within ESIP. So the call for sessions is out and then a few other things to note, there'll be a geosemantic symposium ahead of the meeting again on Monday before the meeting starts on Tuesday. Um, and there's also gonna be a joint ESIP OGC API coverage analytics sprint. So some activities that are um, around, around the meeting that aren't um, directly involved with the meeting, but we are looking for sessions. And so if you have ideas for ways that you'd like to continue this conversation, we are we would be really open to that. And then the last thing I just, most of you are familiar with ESIP and I'll put these two links um, in the chat, but there are many ways to participate in ESIP. This is just one set of um, webinars that crosses a lot of ESIP activities, but we have many different collaboration areas that meet monthly. Um, the calendar is there, and then we have a one pager that gives you kind of a synopsis of ESIP activities as well as a Monday update for staying up to date on the, the regular activities. And then if your organization is not a member of ESIP, I would encourage you to join. Um, but I really appreciate everybody for being here on Friday afternoon um, and participating in this great conversation. And with that, we'll close it out. Thanks so much. Have a good weekend. <laughs>